The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello again, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another SEPA webinar. Today's webinar is titled, How the Field of Electrophysiology Relates to the Clinical Exercise Physiologist. Our presenter is C.J. Shields. And just a brief summary on this webinar. Uh, it's a general overview of the EKG and review of the I. Tobin's Triangle. Um, for a quick recognition of uh, atrial and ventricular arrhythmias. Uh, explanation of the field of electrophysiology and what is done during the EP study and different ablation procedures will also be discussed. And finally, uh, uh, we will look at how uh, we relate this field of EP to clinical exercise ph physiologists and how these two fields can work together. Uh, for the betterment of the patient. Uh, just a, a brief summary on uh, CJ. She's been working in the field of electrophysiology for the uh, past 18 years after completing her master's in exercise physiology from Syracuse University. She's had several appointments uh, as an electrophysiologist. Uh, she's worked for uh, Biosense uh, Webster for over 10 years, uh, helping to develop the Cardo system but most recently, she uh, has an appointment at the University of Texas uh, Health Electrophysiology Heart Cardiovascular uh, Training Program. So I'd like to uh, give uh, uh, CJ the, uh, the floor here. And uh, I would also ask that everyone, uh, please, uh, if you do have questions, we will uh, answer them at the end of the, uh, the webinar. All right, so enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, hello, everyone. Welcome this afternoon to this webinar. Uh, my name is C.G. Shields, and I am down here at the University of Texas um, McGovern Medical School in the EP Heart Cardiovascular EP Training Program. Um, give you a little idea of what we're going to do today. Get my computer going here. So our, object our objectives today, we're going to review the EKG just on a quick, uh, quick basis know what the frontal leads and precordial leads and how they relate to EP. I'm going to define electrophysiology. So anytime you hear me say EP during this presentation, I'm talking about electrophysiology. Just makes it a little easier to say EP. Uh, we'll talk about catheter placements, kind of the intercardiac signals and what we see inside the heart when we're in these studies. Uh, identify and analyze some basic arrhythmias, and then we're going to put it all together. So throughout the presentation, I'll kind of relate it to how it may work in your field, um, what we're doing in the EP lab, and how that relates to what you might see in, in cardiac rehab or doing stress tests or something to that, and maybe in the hospital setting. So a little bit about the EKG. We all should be fairly familiar with it. Um, it gives us the physician a good understanding of what's currently going on and what has occurred in the past. Um, we know that uh, every time it has, uh, the patient should be on an EKG for any kind of cardiac rehab or stress test. We know that. So looking at that, we can see the electrical pattern properties of what's going on. It also gives us the geometry of the heart tissue. It lets us know if there's an access change or some sort of deviation and the metabolic state of what the heart is at that particular moment in time. Um, it's a wealth of information, and it's used as a, in a wide range of non-invasive tests. So on the flip side of that, the, there is a cautionary note to the EKG. Um, there will always, always, always be some sort of electrophysiological phenomenon which will not conform with anything that you're, you're aware of. Um, we see it every day in the EP world. Uh, they had a tachycardia out in uh, in just out in society or whatever normal daily basis and we look at the EKG and we think it's coming from one spot and then we take them to the lab and it's coming from somewhere totally out, totally different just because of that patient and what's going on with their status and antiarrhythmic drugs that they may be having or some sort of metabolic disturbances. So always remember that the EKG is there. It's what we look at as normal but at the end of the day there always will be some sort of Unexplained, unexplained phenomenon going on sometimes. Um, just a quick overview. Again, the 12 lead placement, um, right arm, right leg, left arm, left leg, and the precordial leads. Uh, important for us in the EP lab that these are put exactly where they're supposed to be put. I know sometimes in 
um, not in the lab, they get put a little lower, or a little higher, maybe not in just the exact location. Um, but when we are in the EP lab, we make sure that the, the leads are put on correctly. You know, the fourth intercostal space and around, um, because if they're not, what we're thinking um, is coming from one direction may actually be coming from somewhere else. Uh, again, make sure the patient is shaved, make sure you have good contact. All that goes into play when we get into the EP lab. So the EKG itself, we do know it records a cardiac electrical activity. Uh, it gives us the diagnosis of many cardiac conditions from hypertrophy to arrhythmias. Um, it measures the current in many different directions, which therefore gives us a grapho, a, gives us a repre representation of exactly the distinct area that the arrhythmia is coming from inside the heart, just by knowing the, the vectors of the forms of the heart in Einhoven's triangle. Um, we know the six limb leads, so lead one, two, three, AVR, AVL, and ABF. These limb leads are going to record the electrical activity in the heart's frontal plane. Um, I'm going to show two videos now. Um, it's actually from a website called akadoodle.com. I use it a lot in my teachings down here to go through the EKG. Um, the presenter gives a very good um, definition of looking at the limb leads and then the procordial leads, along with some good presentation of the, the vectors and stuff. So sit back and watch these couple videos here. So this is on the frontal leads. Remember, the frontal leads examine the flow of depolarization and repolarization through the heart in the vertical or frontal plane. And as we've just seen, in the frontal plane, we have two major depolarization vectors traveling through the main muscle mass of the left ventricle. One moving predominantly downwards and to the left from the anterior fascicle, and one moving in a predominantly leftwards direction from the posterior fascicle. In most normal individuals, these two depolarization vectors travel simultaneously through the left ventricular myocardium and dominate the QRS morphology in all frontal leads. But as they are moving in different directions simultaneously, how do they interact together to determine the QRS morphology in the frontal leads? Well, if we add them together using the parallelogram rule, we find that they generate an overall vector traveling downwards and to the left at approximately 60 degrees relative to lead one. Using the principles we learned in our previous videos, we can see that this vector is well within 90 degrees of the inferior leads. So the QRS complexes are expected to be strongly positive in these leads with dominant all waves. It is also well within 90 degrees of lead one. So this lead also tends to have a strongly positive QRS complex. Note, however, it is traveling almost directly away from lead AVR, so it produces a negative deflection in this lead. Note also that at 60 degrees relative to lead 1, the overall vector is traveling at 90 degrees relative to lead AVL, and the QRS complex in this lead is therefore expected to be of low or even no amplitude in accordance with the vector principles we have discussed. Again, we note that septal depolarization begins before the main muscle mass of the left ventricle depolarizes. And in this plane, septal depolarization is not only moving from left to right, but also upwards from the diaphragmatic aspect of the septum. So this early septal current is moving away from the inferior leads. Therefore, it is not uncommon to see physiological Q waves in these leads and an initial R wave in AVR. As we've seen with the chest leads, cardiac repolarization takes place in the opposite direction to the depolarization wave. So the T waves in the frontal leads also tend to be concordant with the QRS complexes. Finally, we will consider atrial depolarization in the frontal leads. 
Atrial depolarization vectors are much more prominent in the frontal plane compared to the transverse plane. And P waves tend to be more prominent in these leads. As the SA node is situated high in the right atrium, atrial depolarization spreads predominantly downwards and to the left in this plane, producing strongly positive P waves in the left sided and inferior leads, particularly in lead 2. As these forces are moving away from the AVR, the P wave is negative in this lead. You will learn that there is considerable variation in the position of the heart in the chest cavity and the precise anatomy of the cardiac conducting system between normal individuals. These factors change the position of the total frontal depolarization vector relative to the leads. And as we've seen, the position of this vector is the major determinant of the morphology of the QRS complexes in the frontal leads. Variation in its position relative to the leads produces variations in QRS morphology between normal individuals. So I hope that was just a quick overview of the limb leads. Um, we all should have some sort of background with that. The main thing that we need to remember is that we should have predominantly positive R waves in leads 2, 3, and AVF, and that we should have a negative lead in AVR. Um, the other thing that we need to know, remember from this video is when we're looking at the P waves, our P wave morphology, we always look at lead 2, and we want to make sure that it is upright and positive in lead 2. So if it is, that means it's, we know it's coming from the sinus node and down. So this is why it's very important that we have our 12 lead on correctly because the electrophysiologists are looking at these normal um, characteristics. So if they see anything abnormal, then they know where to look for from there. So next, let's go on to our precordial leads or our chest leads. And remember that these, are, these leads look at the heart in the transverse plane. Oops, let me go back, sorry. The chest leads examine the flow of depolarization and repolarization in the transverse plane, as illustrated here. We will focus initially on events in the septal leads, V1 and V2, and the left lateral leads, V5 and V6. The sinoatrial node is situated towards the back of the right atrium. Atrial depolarization therefore spreads from this structure forwards and leftwards through the walls of the atrium in the transverse plane. This produces a positive deflection in the chest leads. Atrial depolarization forces are quite weak in this plane, and P waves produced tend to be of low amplitude. Following atrial depolarization, and after the usual physiological delay in the AV node, depolarization enters the intraventricular conducting system. Depolarization traveling through the conducting system produces no deflection on the ECG, and the tracing remains on the isoelectric line. Within the ventricles, depolarization is initially released from the conducting system into the myocardium the left side of the mid-zone of the interventricular septum. And in the transverse plane, depolarization then spreads from left to right within the structure. Release of the depolarization wave from the conducting system into the myocardium of the septum is associated with the onset of the QRS complex. The early septal signal moving directly towards the chest leads V1 and V2, produces an initial R wave in these leads. As this depolarization event is moving away from leads V5 and V6, we see a Q wave develop in these leads. As septal depolarization is taking place, depolarizing signal is released from the conducting system into the subendocardial region of the main mass of the ventricles and subsequently spreads outwards from the endocardial to the epicardial surface of the heart. Depolarization of the left ventricle dominates the ECG signal in all leads and as this signal is moving towards V5 and V6, 
these leads develop strong R waves, while deep S waves form in leads V1 and V2. When ventricular depolarization is complete, there then follows a period where no current is flowing in the heart and the tracing returns to the isoelectric line. This period ends with the onset of ventricular repolarization. And as we've seen, because the repolarization wave is moving in the opposite direction to the depolarization wave, the T waves produced in the leads tend to be concordant with the QRS complexes. So, because of their position relative to the heart, left ventricular depolarization produces overall negative QRS complexes in the septal leads, V1 and V2, and positive QRS complexes in leads V5 and V6. In most normal individuals, the dominant depolarization vectors in the anterior and lateral walls of the left ventricle summate together close to are within 90 degrees of lead V3. The QRS complex in this lead therefore tends to be either positive or, as shown here, isoelectric. The QRS complex in lead V4 tends to be strongly positive. The change from predominantly negative QRS complexes in the septal leads to predominantly positive complexes in the chest leads at V3 or V4 is termed normal transition. The development of dominant R waves from lead V4 through to lead V6 is termed normal R wave progression. This reflects a healthy muscle mass in the left ventricle. Normal R wave progression may be lost in infarcts affecting the left ventricle. Note also that the ECG signal from depolarizing muscle is affected by tissues surrounding the heart. These tissues tend to dampen the signal transmitted to the leads. For this reason, the R wave is often taller in lead V5 or V4 compared to lead V6, as the electrical signal received by lead V6 travels through more aerated lung. The readout from the chest or precordial leads are recorded in numerical order down the left-hand side of the ECG printout. So that was a quick overview of our chest leads. Um, precordial leads, we want to make sure that we have that normal R-way progression from V1 through V6. Uh, if we don't see that, then we know that we have some sort of disease tissue that we're looking at. It also helps us when we're looking at PVCs to know um, where those PVCs are coming from. And what I mean by that is we're looking at the heart in areas of where the infarct may be coming from or where the PVC may be coming from. So if we have a change in like our V1 through V4, then we know it's affecting the anterior or anterior side of the heart. If it's, there's a change out in V4 through V6 or lead one in AVL, we know it's in the anterolateral part of the heart. Um, if there's just a change in one and AVL, then we know we're strictly looking at the lateral um, section. Inferiorly, we look at 2, 3, and AVF. Um, 2, 3, and AVF are important to us. Um, most of the heart actually sits below 2, 3, and AVF, so that we know if there's a positive deflection in that, we know the, the arrhythmia is coming from the top going down. If 2, 3, and AVF happen to be negative, then we know that the arrhythmia starts at the lower base, lower apex of the heart and is traveling upward. Um, and then if we think and we add V5 and V6 to that, then we're looking at the inferior plus the lateral side. So having a good understanding of Einhoven's triangle and the directionality of the vectors gives us an idea of where those arrhythmias are coming from. And this is basically is what EP is all about. Um, we're just taking the EKG and we're looking at the surface and then we go from here and we go actually inside the heart. So basic rules to remember for the EKG. It's a standard 10 second printout. Um, 2, 3 and AVF are inferior. AVR should never be positive. If you can remember that, it should never be positive. If it is, then we definitely have some sort of axis deviation going on. QRS should be dominant and upright in leads one and two. 
um, the QRS and T wave should have the same general direction in the limb leagues. And then you should have your R wave progression. The R wave should grow from V1 to at least V4. The S wave must grow from V1 to at least V3 and then disappear by the time it's in V6. Um, your ST segment should stay isoelectric. Um, we know if we get some ST segment depression or elevation, then that's telling us we have some sort of ischemia going on. And then when we're looking at our P waves and our atrial arrhythmias, we want to make sure and look a normal P wave should be upright and positive in lead two. Um, lead two is where we're generally looking. It will be upright in one and V2 to V6, but overall we want to look at um, lead two. So those are just some general rules to remember. If you can remember those, then you have a good idea of what a normal EKG should look like. So now, taking our normal EKG, I want to go a little step further and we're going to go into the world of electrophysiology. So when we go into an EP lab, um, the patients have some sort of tachycardia, some sort of arrhythmia going on. It's been documented. And so the EP doc is going to take them into the lab and we're going to find out where this arrhythmia comes from. Uh, how do we do that? Well, what we do is we take catheters that have electrodes on them. These catheters can have four electrodes, six electrodes, eight, ten. They can have up to 20 electrodes and they can be spaced in different spacings to give us an idea. Um, we will generally put four catheters in and these four catheters have specific places in the heart that we want to look at. So first we'll put a high right atrial catheter in. This catheter will sit up by the SA node and it's going to give us an idea of what's going on in the atrium. So if you look here, you'll see your normal EKG. That's your surface that you're used to looking at. And then this signal right here is the signal that is actually coming from exact specific location of where that catheter is inside the heart. So it's called an intercardiac signal. So this is an atrial intercardiac excuse me, an atrial intercardiac signal that corresponds with the P wave of the surface EKG. Um, the next catheter we put in is going to be a His catheter. Um, this catheter is very important because it's going to lie at the level of the AV node. Um, we all know that the AV node is our, is our connection between our atrium and our ventricle. The conduction system has to go from the SA node to the AV node down to the ventricle. So we put a catheter there and we know it's at the level of the AV node because we get three distinct signals. We get an atrial signal, we get an H or a His signal, and we get a ventricular signal. So this His signal here in the middle, this H, that is actually your AV node. Um, that tells us where the AV node is located in the heart so we can avoid it, so we don't want to necessarily burn it or make any damage to it. And it will also give us an idea of conduction delays, and where that conduction delay is. Is it above the node or below the node? The next catheter we'll place is a coronary sinus catheter. Um, this usually has 10 electrodes on it. We want a little bit more information, and we put it in the coronary sinus vein that lies along the AV groove. Um, this vein, it's an epicardial structure, um, but what it tells us is it gives us atrial and ventricular signals because it's lying in that AV groove, but it also gives us information of what's going on in the right atrium and the left atrium. So we know if, you know, signals on 1, 2 come before signals on 9, 10, we know that that arrhythmia is originating in the left atrium versus the right atrium. And then the last catheter we put in is a ventricular signal. Um, we just put it down in the RV apex, and it's a ventricular intercardiogram, and it lies up with your QRS. So those are our main catheters that we're putting in the heart. So we want to see the exact signal or the exact conduction that's going on um, at that point of where that catheter is located. So this is kind of what it looks like in the lab. Um, our tracing, our EKGs, we run at 100 sweep speed. I think you're probably used to seeing it at 25 sweep speed most of the time. We just make it spread it out a little bit wider so we can see the exact sequence of uh, normal conduction going down. So if you look at this, we have our normal surface leads, lead one, ABF, V1, and V6. And then these are the signals that we're seeing from inside the heart. So we have high right atrium, we have an AHV, so this would be our His or AV node area. And then we have our CS, so this is CS proximal to distal, and then our ventricular signal. So this would be what normal conduction sequence looks like from inside the heart. Um, it's important for us when we're looking at AV blocks and things to measure this His area 
we look at this measurement between the atrium and the, the his signal, the AH, um, that's the time it's taking it to go from the SA node to the AV node, and sometimes that can be delayed. So if you have a long PR interval, first degree AV block, we can decide in the lab, is that above the node or below the node by measuring the AH interval and measuring this HV interval. So the HV interval is the time it takes a signal to actually get through the His bundle. So if I have a longer HV interval, then I have a, a delay below the node, and that's going to lead me to believe that that patient may be able to be susceptible to complete heart block um, because it's below the node. So, and those combined, the AHV gives us that PR measurement. So that's kind of why we do baselines. We want to make sure we know what is normal for this patient. Um, to go a little bit more into our AV blocks, I'm pretty sure we're all familiar with first degree, second degree, and third degree, but I wanted to just give a little idea of how that relates to us in the lab. Um, first degree, we really don't care much about it. It's pretty benign. Um, we'll measure those AH and HV intervals like I was talking about before, and if it's the AH is longer, it takes a longer time to get from the node down to the SA node down to the AV node, we really don't worry too much about it. But for some reason, if the HV is longer and it takes, uh, it takes a longer time to get through the His bundle, then that patient could potentially be needing a pacemaker in the future. So that's the only reason why first degree AV block may be of any importance to us, if that block is below the node. Um, our second degree, our Mobitz 1 or Winky Bach, everybody, and everybody has Winky Bach. It's a normal function of the AV node. If I pace faster in the atrium, eventually the AV node is going to say, stop, I'm not letting you go down anymore, my ventricles need time to fill. So in every EP case, we will do um, a winky box cycle link. We want to know what is normal for that patient. Does it occur very early or does it, <coughs> excuse me, does it occur at a very slow rate or does it occur at a very fast rate? Um, both of those can give us an idea of what is going on with this arrhythmia. And you may see this on doing a stress test or even, <coughs> excuse me, in cardiac rehab. Some people will be in winky box just in a normal setting. And it's not anything that's wrong. It's actually a normal function of the heart that's going on. And this is what it looks like with the catheters inside the heart. We actually are pacing the atrium. And you can see the conduction sequence going down. So this would be paced, HV, paced, HV. And you can see this time getting longer and longer. And then eventually we drop a QRS and it goes back shorter. So it's exactly what you're seeing on the surface EKG that you're probably used to, but now we can see it inside the heart and where exactly that um, lengthening is occurring. And then second degree, we know we have a, a relationship between our P's and QRS, but we just end up dropping a, a P wave every now and then. Um, good indication eventually for a pacemaker. And then of course our third degree, and our third degree is no communication. Um, for us in the EP lab, if we ever see third degree, it means we've probably done something to create it. We've hit the AV node, we've burned the AV node on accident. Um, so it's something that we have to be very uh, cognizant of and we have to be able to recognize it right away um, that we've, we've lost our communication between our A's and our B's. So when we're in the lab, we've got our catheters up, we've done our basic measurements, we know what normal is for this patient. And then after that, we're just going to go and we're going to start pacing. We're going to assess um, the, ref the refractoriness of the tissues. We're going to look and see how long it takes to get from the SA node to the AV node. And then, of course, we're going to try to induce the arrhythmia. If we have an idea of what it is because we've seen that EKG, um, then we can know what we're looking for and we can try to induce that arrhythmia. And we do it just by rapid atrial pacing or throwing in some quick atrial beats or trying to get into the refract, refractory periods of the tissues. And then we do it in the ventricle also. Um, the big thing in the ventricle is looking at retrograde conduction. Can your, can your ventricles um, beat and then send a signal back up to the atrium? Um, many arrhythmias occur because of that retrograde conduction back. Not everybody has it. Some people have it and it doesn't do anything. And then other people have it and it creates arrhythmias. So we'll get it a little bit into what we're seeing and how we're doing it. Um, 
Our atrial arrhythmias, like we talked about before, we're always looking at P waves and we're always looking at lead two. Uh, it should be upright and positive in lead two. If it's not, then we have some sort of arrhythmia going on. Um, if it's pointed, maybe it's a PAC, it can be squiggly. If it's inverted in lead two, that just tells us that the arrhythmia is coming from down low in the atrium instead of the SA node. So you've got some sort of ectopic focus going on that may be creating an atrial tachycardia. Um, you could have a TP phenomenon. That just means the P wave is kind of buried in the T wave. This happens a lot when you see a, a fast, narrow, complex tachycardia. So if you're doing some sort of test with a patient and all of a sudden they go into a fast, narrow, regular, complex tachycardia, you may not see a P wave. Um, and then the sawtooth, this should be pretty familiar to everyone. This is your typical flutter, you that sawtooth pattern. And then this one is atrial fibrillation. You have no discernible P waves. Um, it's just kind of irregular, erratic atrial activity. So looking at this, I just kind of wanted to give you a quick idea in case you might see this in the lab um, or doing something uh, with a patient. If you have a very fast rate, very regular rate, um, both of these are going at 150 beats a minute. Um, the difference, though, one of them is an atrial tack and one of them is an atrial flutter. And the way we know the difference is looking at this isoelectric line. Every time this EKG comes down, we have a nice isoelectric line. So that means we have a P buried in this T wave. Um, so that's an atrial tack. Well, here we have this sawtooth. We have this wavy baseline, I guess, so to speak. So here we have basically two P waves for every one QRS. This is a two to one conducted atrial flutter. Um, just kind of gives you an idea of the difference of the mechanisms just by looking at an EKG. So if I take this atrial tachycardia here and I bring this patient into the lab, this is what we'll see inside the lab. We've got our normal EKG, our surface up here, and you can see the P wave is actually inverted. It's inverted here in one and it should be positive. And then here's our CS channels, our hiss, and this is our ablation. Um, we put a catheter in the heart and we rove that catheter around looking for signals. And every time we rove it around, then we'll see and we'll take points and we'll create a map that I'll show you here in a second. So if you see, this is the P wave and this is our signal. It's very low and fractionated and it's very early. Everything in EP is all about what's earliest, because if it's early, then it's beating out the SA node and it's causing the tachycardia to start. So here, this spot is 52 milliseconds earlier than the, the normal P wave. So for us, we're saying, hey, that's, that's early. That's probably where this tachycardia is coming from. So we take that information and we build this, this map. And this here is where a lot of um, people with our degrees kind of come into the medical device industry, so to speak. Um, they are the ones who are running these 3D mapping systems for the companies out there like Boston Scientific, um, Biosense Webster, and Abbott or St. Jude's. So we take the signals from inside the heart, these intercardiacs, take points, and we create these maps. And what these maps tell us is uh, red is early. So this spot right here is where that tachycardia is coming from. So we've taken all these points, we've measured them or, or compared them to a, a stable position, and we found out that that atrial tachycardia is coming from this one spot. And so we can take our ablation catheter and we can burn the tissue right there in the heart and that tissue then is now dead, and so that it can't fire, so now the atrial tachy tachycardia stops. So that's kind of the what's going on in the EP lab and where um, people with our degrees can kind of come into, into play. So all these companies hire people with um, degrees in nursing, biomedical engineer, and, and exercise science, so it's pretty interesting. This gives you another idea of a different tachycardia, very common, it's called AVNRT. And AVNRT stands for atrioventricular nodal reentry tachycardia. Um, if you look up here, this is our surface EKG. Um, very regular, very fast. You don't see any discernible P waves. Um, so you probably have that T on P phenomenon or something to that effect. When we put our catheters inside the heart, it tells the story of what's actually going on. So we have a high right atrial signal, we have our ventricular signal, our CS and our HIS 
And notice all of them are on top of each other. It's what we call A's and V's are stacked. It means everything is on top of each other and activation to the atrium and the ventricle are happening at the exact same time. And the other thing that we notice here in our hiss, so and remember our hiss is sitting at the level of that AV node, the hiss signal right here comes first. So we know it's starting in the AV node and it's expanding or it's, it's projecting out to the atrium and then conducting down to the ventricle. So in this case, these patients tend to have a little extra pathway within their AV node um, and we can go in, once we induce this, we know exactly what it is and we can do a burn of the slow pathway and this patient will never have um, AVN, AVNRT again. So it makes you feel good that you can cure a patient with um, a one little burn and, and be done and they will never have it. Um, this gives you an idea of typical flutter. So you're probably pretty used to seeing the sawtooth pattern on the EKG, but when we go into the EP lab, we actually see the circuit and how it's working in the heart. So here you look at your colors. So start like the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet and the red and the violet meet each other. So we know it's a circuit. We know it's just continually going around and around and around, similar to like a dog chasing its tail. Um, so this is what typical flutter, those sawtooth atrial pattern that you're used to seeing on an EKG, this is what it looks like inside the lab. So the person sitting at the system has taken all these points and they've created and actually found where the circuit is going. And in typical flutter, the circuit goes around the tricuspid valve. And so at this point in time, we have to decide, okay, I know where the circuit is. How do I terminate it? How do I burn it? And for this case, we just burn a line from our valve down to our IVC. So it kind of looks like this. We have a catheter inside the heart. This is a 20-pole catheter. It's giving us all these signals coming from inside the heart. We've burned a line um, between the think about six o'clock on the tricuspid valve down to the IVC, and that stops it, and then we can do testing to determine whether or not our line is, is good or not. So we can, again, this kind of um, case is very successful. It's about a 90% success rate for the patient, but they won't ever have typical flutter again. AFib has been a hot topic lately. You see it on the news, you see it on, on TV. Um, we've learned within the last probably 10 years which is fairly new, that AFib originates from the pulmonary veins in the left atrium. So if you look up at your surface EKG, it looks kind of erratic. You have a sinus and then a PAC and then sign a couple beats, but you don't see P waves. Um, but when we look inside the heart at our inner cardiacs, we can tell exactly that wherever this lasso catheter is sitting, that um, it's firing. And it's firing and getting to the atrium, which is causing the atrial fibrillation. So, for an AFib ablation, we actually go in and we will isolate um, the pulmonary veins. So we burn around them. So if you see here, in this case, we've burned around the veins and you've got normal sinus rhythm. This patient, it looks wonderful up here, normal sinus. But then if you look at this catheter that's sitting in the veins, it goes into AFib. So you see the erratic um, signals here, but they can't get out to the atrium because the atrium is still on normal sinus rhythm. So we've done our job. We've gone in, we've isolated this vein so it can fire all it's wants, but it's not gonna get out to the atrium and that patient won't have AFib anymore. Um, so it's very, pretty cool. Um, so those are kind of our atrial things that we look at, basically atrial tacks, flutters, um, AFib. We also do some accessory pathways and things like that. Um, in the ventricle, Again, we mainly will focus on PVCs or premature ventricular contractions and VT. Um, PVCs can occur uh, in a normal, healthy individual. Uh, for whatever reason, they have a spot in the ventricle that just decides to want to fire, and they can be of different morphologies. And that 12 lead, when, you, when it's on the patient, is actually giving us an idea of where that morphology is coming from. So we have an idea actually going before we go into the lab. We can say, oh, this is coming from the RVOT, or the right ventricular outflow tract, just by the way it looks on the surface 12 lead EKG. So what we'll do inside the lab, if you kind of get an idea, is 
they look over here at our rhythm, we have a sinus B, a PVC, a sinus B, a PVC. So this patient's actually in bigeminal PVCs. Um, so what we will do is they'll take a catheter up, and every time the patient goes in a PVC, they'll take a point, and then they'll look at those signals from inside that heart as to exactly where that PVC is coming from. So again, red is early, and early in EP is where we want to go because that's the spot that's causing the arrhythmia. So at this point in time, they would take an ablation catheter and burn right at this spot. And when they burn there, that should terminate these PVCs because that tissue can't fire anymore. It's dead. So this is ultrasound. Um, we use ultrasound in the EP lab. You can see the aortic valve is going right here. And this is the pulmonic valve over here. So this is like the RVOT area, the right ventricular outflow tract. Um, in the right ventricle. So very common location for someone to have PVCs who doesn't have any structural um, heart issues. And this just gives you another idea. So we're taking fluoro images, which is 2D, and we're creating these 3D maps um, to find the location of where this PVC is coming from. And looking at the 12 lead, you can tell it's 2, 3, and AVF are positive, so we know it's coming from up top. And then we have actually concordance across all the cordial leads. So this is coming from the LV summit, which is way up around out the, the coronary sinus up by the aortic valves. And this just gives you an idea of, again, the picture. And this is the area that we burned, and then that PVC went away. So you can see the signal here is very early. This is the start of the PVC. This signal comes way before. Um, so we know that that's a good location to burn that, <coughs> excuse me, burn that PVC. And then VT, we all, we've all heard of VT. VT usually happens in our sicker patients. Um, they've had some sort of uh, MI in the past. They've had some diseased tissue. Um, for the EP, when we're doing a VT case, we'll actually bring the patient in and we don't necessarily induce them into VT because we know that they're not stable. And so we will do it in sinus rhythm. And when we're in sinus rhythm, we actually look for these late fractionated signals. So this is all just normal sinus. We move our catheter around and we see these late fractionated signals. And that tells us it's disease tissue, which gives us an idea that maybe a, a circuit can go through there. Go. Um, and then this gives you an idea. So this patient had a heart attack. Um, his apex is pretty much dead. So red in this case considered dead tissue. So when we see our signals inside, we see a very strong, healthy signal in purple. And then this area is what we call border zone. So this is healthy, this is dead, it's kind of the tissue in between. We get these fractionated late signals. And then inside the dead area, we can actually have some signals. And these signals are what cause the VT to happen. So we go in there and we find all these and we burn them. And then that way they, um, hopefully will not have their VT anymore. And then having the, the 12 lead, so again, if you ever have a patient that has VT and they have a, a 12 lead on or something, you always wanna to try to grab it after you tend to the patient for sure, but having that 12 lead gives us an idea we can go in and pace the heart and try to coordinate it, coordinate it or, um, to the, the intrinsic rhythm. So if we pace and it looks exactly the same, then we know we're coming from the same area. So it's very important to have um, that 12 lead and be in the right position on those uh, leads. So this just kind of gives you a little, I know it's a lot of information and, and we do a lot in the EP lab. So we're taking that general basic 12 lead that you're doing and we're breaking it down and looking at every aspect of the conduction system. But this just kind of gives you a nice flow chart of if you're seeing a 12 lead, okay, is there a P wave, yes or no? And then just following the chart, and it gives you an idea of what you might be um, looking at. So some final thoughts. Um, EP is, is actually just taking the EKG to another level. We're looking at the electrical signals from inside the heart to find and terminate the arrhythmias that are occurring. Um, we create these 3D electroanatomical maps um, with all the information that we received during the procedure with our catheters inside the heart, looking at the intercardiac signals. 
we are able to take the 2D fluoro image and make it into a nice 3D map, which then allows the physician to burn where they need to burn to terminate the arrhythmia. Um, it is one of the fastest growing fields in the medical device in industry. Um, it's growing at a double digit rate right now, and that's projected to continue to grow at a double digit rate for the next few years. Um, they're always, always looking for talented individuals. Um, and again, the main degrees that we're looking for are exercise science, nursing, and biomedical engineers. Um, the main companies out there, the Boston Scientifics, Abbott's, Biosense Webster's, um, they are hiring and looking for those people with these degrees. So we just want to make sure that you're aware. Um, I didn't know anything about the field and I just happened to find my way there. So the more that we can get this out there and, and have another option for people in, um, in the exercise science field, uh, the better. I think it's even a, it's a great place to look into if you're interested in that. So um, that's it. Um, we'll see if we have any questions over here. Okay. There is one, and I gotta figure out how to get there. Oh, there's more than one. Hold on one sec. It says, will these slides be available for us to review after the web webinar? Yes, I'm going to send uh, the slides to a PDF so you can get, you will be able to get them after that. Uh, there was so much info I'd like to review and study. Awesome. What exactly does the catheter do? So. The catheters inside the heart that I showed the picture of, um, they just give us signals. That's all the catheters do inside the heart. Um, they give us signals. And then we have, we put up a specific catheter called an ablation catheter, and that catheter is able to actually burn the heart tissue using radio frequency energy. So we'll look for the signals inside the heart, we'll find where it comes from, and then we actually burn the tissue. So we're burning inside on the endocardium of the heart to get rid of that signal so that little area of tissue cannot um, generate the arrhythmia. So it helps it to terminate so they don't have it anymore. What can I tell my cardiac rehab patients to expect when they are scheduled for EP studies? Good question. Um, it's similar, most cardiac rehab patients have had a heart cath um, for one reason or another. That's probably why they're in cardiac rehab. They've had some sort of um, MI or some sort of plumbing issue with their arteries. So an EP study is then just, it's exactly like a cardiac cath. They go into usually the cath lab, it's usually the same place, um, and they get, a lot of times it's just under conscious sedation. Um, some of the more complex procedures, they will put the patients under general anesthesia, uh, but then they just go and they put big IVs basically in your groins and they will run catheters from your groin through your femor femoral vein up into the heart. So the only thing the patient really feels is like a stick and a burn, that lidocaine, um, just like if you were to go to the dentist. Um, they'll feel that to numb the area, and then after that, they just feel pressure. Um, when the catheters go up in the heart and we're pacing, sometimes they might feel the pacing just because we increase their heart rate, um, but there really is no pain. Um, they're just kind of there. They, if they go, if we can induce them into their arrhythmia, then they might feel their arrhythmia. They might feel their heart going fast. Um, when we're burning inside the heart, um, most patients actually don't feel it. Um, sometimes if they do, they'll feel arm pain, like, uh, like heart attack, arm pain, kind of shoulder pain. And then as soon as we stop burning, it goes away. Um, so it's a pretty easy procedure, I should say, uh, regarding the patient. I mean, they come in, it's exactly like a heart cath. We're going through the same area, uh, through the groins up into the heart. Um, so most of the time, they will st stay the night just to observe for the night. But other than that, uh, if it's an easy procedure, they may even go home the same day. Um, so that's kind of what they can expect to do an EP procedure. So I think... That was all the questions. Let me just double check. How can I how can I describe the procedure to the patients? Um, best way to describe the procedure is looking at looking at the conduction system of the heart. You know, they're they're trying the EP is trying to find where that arrhythmia is coming from, and once they find it, they're going to um, 
take care of it. That's kind of how I've always uh, told patients that, that ask that question. Um, when we go up into the heart, we look at the conduction system, we look at the electrical activity of the heart, we find exactly where that um, arrhythmia goes, is coming from, and then we burn the tissue there. And normally they don't feel it. Um, a lot of times they're just under conscious sedation and, and don't remember it. So I hope that helps. Let's see, any other questions? Um, I don't see any other questions. So I hope this kind of gave you an idea of, of what EP is about. Um, like I said, it's a, it's a growing field. Uh, feel free to uh, ask me any other questions or if you'd like, you can find my information online on, on the website. So um, feel free to send me an email or whatever and I'd be happy to explain anything from this point on if you need. And that's all. I hope you all have a great day.